and welcome to GameSack. Let's take a look at some more games that generally don't get a lot of attention or appreciation. In fact, a lot of these games didn't get enjoyed by many people even in their own time. Let's start out with a game that usually goes for over $200, so get your wallets ready, or at least your SD card or emulator. How about Dragon Fighter on the NES, designed by Natsume and published by Sofell in 1991? This game doesn't present you with any story or other nonsense like that. You're taken straight to stage one where you need to battle enemies with your rather short sword. In addition to your sword, you can also hold down the attack button and release a charge shot. As you kill enemies, you fill up the lower bar that lives in the top corner of the screen. Once this bar has enough power, it begins to flash. Now you can do something special if you hold up and press jump. Get this, you'll then turn into a dragon. When this happens, the screen scrolls automatically and you fire towards the right. You can't turn around. You'll remain a dragon until the power bar runs out and you can't cancel it. As you're playing, you'll come across capsules that will change your color. You have your choice of green, red, or blue. Depending on your color, your dragon will have a different attack power. The green dragon fires a three-way shot. The red dragon fires an ice type thing on the ground, which kind of reminds me of one of the weapons from Ghouls and Ghosts. I don't care for this one much. The blue dragon is my favorite because he fires a homing shot, which is extremely helpful. The enemies will drop items sometimes after you kill them. These will usually refill your life bar a bit. Sometimes they'll drop a ring, which will kill all of the enemies on screen. But usually when this happens, it's the last enemy to die, so there's nobody left for the ring to kill. Oh well. You start the game with relatively little life, but after you defeat each boss, your life bar increases and your power shot becomes stronger. The enemies are all designed to be extremely annoying. Most of them come right at you and they don't care if you're busy dealing with another enemy. You'll eventually figure out how to handle them, but you certainly won't be getting through this game unscathed. The enemies themselves could probably be more interesting. In the first stage, they're just throwing snowballs at you. If that's not enough, giant sentient snowflakes come down from the sky and try to touch you. And trust me, they hurt. The bosses are pretty cool, however, their attack patterns are usually pretty easy to figure out. And the blue dragon will absolutely destroy most bosses with ease. The game only gives you one life with three continues and you start over from the very beginning of the stage. Honestly, it's probably a good thing, otherwise it'd be fairly easy to walk right through this one, especially if you have the blue dragon. I was able to beat it, but it took me using up all my continues and then starting over from scratch four times. By the way, in the final stage, you play as the gray dragon and it plays as a horizontal shooter. It seems easy at first until you realize there's no way to refill your life here. The graphics are good, but I wouldn't say they're among the best on the system. I think the main character sprite could use a couple of more colors. It looks like he's wearing a cap with a feather in it or something stupid, but if you look closely, you see he's wearing the skull of an evil creature that he previously defeated. If that part were colored white, it'd be easier to tell what it is. The music is really good. Again, not some of the best on the console, but still some great stuff here. The generic name was probably why this one was overlooked. It doesn't stand out in the sea of similarly titled games on the platform. That, and it came out when the Super Nintendo was getting ready to launch. It's definitely worth a playthrough on your favorite console or device that plays NES games. Did you ever play Two Crude Dudes released by Data East on the Genesis in 1992? I know it says 1991 on the title screen, but it actually didn't get distributed on home consoles until 1992. This beat-em-up is a spiritual successor to Bad Dudes. Anyway, several nukes have gone off destroying New York City, and of course that means the government needs you to fight off some street gangs. So how about it? Are you a crude enough dude to save New York City? On the surface, it's a lot like Bad Dudes. It plays on a 2D plane and you can attack, jump, and move between different levels on the screen. But this game is far more advanced than Bad Dudes was with a lot more power and skilled programming. What does that mean? Well, basically it means you can pick stuff up now. You can pick up tons of different things and even throw them to cause massive damage to your enemies. Hell, you can even pick up the enemies themselves. 
this is a great way to knock off a lot of their energy. This game even has an exciting two-player mode for you and your second best friend to enjoy. But watch out, because you can pick each other up as well. So yeah, the gameplay is pretty basic, just keep killing the enemies and press on. As you'd expect, you'll have to kill a boss as well. In fact, the mini-bosses in the boss are the only enemies with life bars. It's kind of weird too, because you'll fight regular enemies with no life bars, and then later in that same stage, that same enemy is there again with a life bar. I guess he's a mini-boss now. Between the stages is a bonus round where you beat up a vending machine to restore your life with delicious cola. This is proof that cola or soda or whatever you want to call it qualifies as a health food. I mean, if it's not, why the hell does his life go up when I drink it? You just can't argue with facts. There's an occasional vending machine during the stages, but it can be tough to drink anything because you're completely vulnerable when you do. There's not a huge variety of enemies here, sadly, but even so, it doesn't feel too repetitive. The worst is when you arch your back and let these dogs chew on your manly milk buttons. Did you just say tits? It sucks because there's really nothing you can do. You just kind of have to stand there and enjoy it. This is based on the arcade game, which is sometimes known as Crude Buster or Too Crude outside of North America. Sadly, the graphics took a huge hit during the conversion, as at this time, games with negative power were as big as you'd get until the second half of the year when Street Fighter II came to the Super NES with 16 megs. I think this game would probably look two or three times as good as it currently does if it were released two years later as a 16 or 20 meg game. Stupid Data East. At least the music converted over from the arcade by Hitoshi Sakimoto sounds really beefy, though he didn't really have a lot to work with when it came to the original melodies. Sadly, the sound effects and especially the voices are pretty rough. Since this game came out when Street Fighter II Mania was ramping up, it really didn't stand much of a chance as this was an old school single plane beat em up. Magazines all but ignored it and so did the public. Still, this one is fun to play and you might be missing a good time if you neglect this game like you've been doing for your entire life. Do you absolutely love animals? I mean, do you just want to protect them with all your might even while playing video games? Do you also hate having money? Well, hell with the mortgage. Why not pick up this next game instead? Here's Growl on the Genesis from Taito, and it was released in 1991. Okay, hearing myself say that sentence, I just suddenly really want to punch myself in the face. Moving on, this is a beat-em-up where you're fighting evil poachers who have been hunting animals to extinction. Apparently all animals, except for humans, since this game makes no distinction. You can choose from four different playable characters with slightly different attributes. The controls are fairly simple. You have an attack button, a jump button, and a special button. Your normal attack on its own is fairly useless. What you want to do is look for a weapon to pick up. Now your attack is significantly more effective and lots more fun to use. There are different weapons you can get from swords, poles, guns, bombs, and even a whip. The whip is great because it can take care of enemies on both sides of you. It also makes you feel like Indiana Jones, which I'm sure is no coincidence. The bomb is pretty cool because when it goes off, it makes your enemy's body parts fly all over the place. It's satisfying to use for sure. But be careful because they can throw bombs at you as well. If you don't have a weapon, then the jump kick is by far the most effective means of attacking enemies and also staying alive. You'll often get surrounded by evil poachers and this is where your special button comes in handy. You'll do some kind of spinny kick depending on your character and you'll be able to get out of that mess. But of course it takes off some life from your life bar. You can also do this move by pressing attack and jump simultaneously, so be careful. This game actually puts a ton of enemies on screen simultaneously. It's really easy to get caught in the middle of them. As you play, you'll come across evildoers who are holding animals captive. Be sure to free the animals as they may help attack the enemies. I especially like it when you free these two elephants from the boat. 
the little one comes and starts running over all of your enemies. They immediately die horrible deaths by extreme dismemberment. Ow! That'll teach you not to be evil. Ugh, I hope you're okay with no longer being solid. Ugh, yeah, righteousness always prevails. Ugh, stupid human, animals rule. Another thing that I think is cool about this game is that, like the arcade version of Double Dragon, the entire game is one continuous scrolling playfield with no break or screen changes. Well, actually it does fade out and back in when you go into this cave, but it's still pretty cool to see the majority of the game as one set piece. I like that. The graphics are by no means taxing the Genesis in any way, but they're good enough. Same goes for the music. It's certainly not Streets of Rage, but it doesn't sound unpleasant. I wish there were a greater variety of music tracks though. This is a port of the arcade game of the same name. As you can see, it definitely looks a lot better. Here, up to four players can play the game simultaneously. But in the Genesis version, you can only enjoy up to one player simultaneously. So why is this one overlooked? Well, honestly, Taito never put much effort into their Genesis games. They used what felt like the most basic programming and graphic skills possible. So games from Taito didn't exactly make heads turn. Oh wait, yeah, I almost forgot. Streets of Rage kind of took the genre to new heights on the system right before this came out. That's probably mainly the reason, I think. Oh, and like I mentioned, it's single player only. That's probably another really good reason. Still, it's worth trying out. It'll make you feel good because if you beat it, you'll have saved all of the animals in the entire world. This is Sub Rebellion on the PlayStation 2 from IREM, which was released in 2002. In this one, you play as a single submarine which has the low pressure burden of saving the entire world from evil. This is funny because IREM also published In the Hunt in 1993 which featured a similar premise. And everyone knows that this game was called In the Hunt because The Hunt for Red October was a very popular book and movie. This is basically a spiritual follow up which needs you to deal with lots and lots more buttons, which of course means it's way more fun. Seriously though, getting the hang of the controls here is going to take you a few minutes. L1 and L2 control your forward and backwards movements. R1 and R2 control your ballast, which makes you rise or sink. The circle button will let you surface and skim around in certain stages, attacking land and air-based enemies. The left stick controls your movement direction, while the right stick controls the camera. The square button fires a rapid shot if you keep tapping it, but if you hold it, you can lock on your missiles to a target. Don't worry, you have an unlimited amount of missiles, which quite honestly surprises me because this game is tough. You have to wait for the gauges on the left to refill before you can lock on again. Each mission has a fairly simple objective, usually destroying a certain amount of such and such an object. Sometimes there's a boss style encounter. Between missions, you can buy some really expensive stuff for your submarine, like the ability to lock onto more targets at once. So not only do you have to save the entire world by yourself, they're charging you big bucks to do it too. Seriously though, once you get the hang of it, this game is really fun. I think the biggest issue is that there are things above and below the water attacking you at all times and it's tough to keep track of where everything is, much less actually deal with it. For example, you're above water trying to attack some surface cannons while some jerks you don't even know are there are attacking you from below. You'll quite often get hit by things you don't see. Oh, and turning and moving happens really, really slow. Oh, and this is true by the way, did you know that at any given time there are more airplanes in the ocean than there are submarines in the sky? Huh? Huh? <clears throat> yeah, moving on. When you destroy certain things like this helicopter that just sits there and drops depth charges, it'll give you an item which provides some strength back to your shield. But it often won't be enough and you'll find yourself restarting the level. Thankfully, there's unlimited continues, just as you'd expect from a PS2 era game that lets you save between levels. The graphics are pretty good for the system, and even though all the levels are basically water levels, they do a good job of making each area look different. I didn't care much for the fifth mission though, as it's a cave maze, and everything looks the same and there's no map. Oh, and sometimes you have to worry about your air supply, so that means there's a time limit, which of course only increases the amount of fun. The sound and especially the music are pretty good in most stages. Not all stages have music though. The aforementioned Mission 5 just has creepy ambient sound and ping noises. 
Like I said, this game can be pretty tough. The missions aren't short, and if you die fighting a boss, you have to start from the beginning of that mission. Still, I found myself playing the missions I was dying on again and again just to keep trying. Even after I thought I was done with the game and I powered the system down, I'd come back later and try again. And that definitely says something for this game. As clunky as it is to play, it's quite unique and definitely interesting. I imagine this game got next to no marketing, and that's why a lot of people don't know about it. If only it had the word hunt somewhere in the title, it could have been a resounding success. So by watching this episode, you've learned about the existence of a few overlooked games. In fact, you may think you know about the existence of every single game ever made. Nope. How could you? I've still got two games left to show you. This one is Genji, Dawn of the Samurai for the PlayStation 2, and it was released by Sony themselves. This game takes place in feudal-ish Japan. It was suggested to me by Norm the Gaming Historian, and I didn't even know about it until he told me. Thanks, Norman. The story is full of lots of silly words that would probably offend some of you if I tried to pronounce them, so let's just go with this basic summary. You're a dude from a clan who is trying to defeat the big evil empire clan. You find out that you happen to be the son of the dude who led the good guy clan, and that makes you able to carry these orb stone thingies. But the evil empire clan has some of these orb stone thingies as well, and that's what makes them powerful. Now you're on a mission to restore justice and peace to the troubled land of Japan. It plays like a mix of Onimusha, the PS2 version of Shinobi, and maybe a dash of Devil May Cry. You have two swords, and you hack and slash your way through enemies with a normal and special attack, each assigned to their own buttons. The combat feels really good. The orb stone thingies grant you a special battle power by pressing the L1 button. When you do this, time slows down and you need to wait for the icon of the square button to appear right next to you. When it does, press it and you'll do a fancy counterattack that causes, you guessed it, massive damage. If you mess up, you'll snap out of it and have to fight the enemies normally like a schlub. It's usually good for disposing of groups more rapidly than just fighting normally. Timing is absolutely critical if you try to do this during boss fights. But wow can you defeat them fast if you're good at this. Good luck, because you'll definitely need it. You also gain experience to level up as well as money as you fight your enemies. The money can be spent in the store to buy better stuff, and fortunately the selection isn't overwhelming or ridiculously expensive. Eventually, another dude will join your clan, but he's big and slow. And he's also really strong. You can choose which person to play as depending on who you feel is best for the mission at hand. In some missions, you'll automatically switch back and forth between the characters as you progress through the level. The good news is that you both level up together and carry the same items as each other at all times. More good news is that both characters are really fun to use and control. The big guy has more life, so I often enjoy using him, but when I switch over to the little guy, he feels just so nimble and quick. Sometimes you might need to grind a bit in order to raise your level before a boss fight, but as I've said many times before, that's not something that usually bothers me. Like Resident Evil and Onimusha, each area is its own thing, and when you go to the next screen, suddenly you're at a different camera angle, which can sometimes be confusing, at least briefly. No tank controls here, but the directional stick will take a second or two to switch over when the screens change sometimes. Fortunately, this never affects battles because scenes don't switch when you're fighting. The bosses can be pretty tough, but I kept trying and trying because I knew I could beat them. And I always did, eventually. The graphics are great for the system, all things considered. The colors and detail are both very lush, with day and nighttime scenes. Sadly, the game is restricted to an interlaced picture and a 4x3 aspect ratio. But at least it all moves at 60 fields per second. It can slow down and drop resolution from time to time during intense scenes like boss fights. The music is very Japanese and it absolutely fits the game, but come on, let's get real. You're not going to be hunting down this soundtrack.
The sound is presented in Pro Logic 2, but there's a Dolby Digital mode where the pre-rendered cutscenes play with some cool 5.1 surround sound. I think the main reason this one gets overlooked is that although it's based on feudal Japan, there are no giant enemy crabs. Oh well, check it out anyway because this one is actually really fun. I'm definitely glad I did. A sequel exists on the PlayStation 3 and I hope to check that out someday soon. A lot of people know about Spy Hunter from Sunsoft on the NES. I actually remember people making a big hoopla over this game back in the day, though to me it was always average at best. It was originally a Bally Midway arcade game, and Sunsoft did a decent port I suppose. I remember people making a really big deal about the Peter Gunn theme like it was an amazing thing to be in a video game. But the game that people rarely ever mention is Super Spy Hunter, also by Sunsoft for the NES, released in 1991. This was an original Sunsoft game called Battle Formula and it was renamed Super Spy Hunter for Western markets. Though it's definitely obvious that they had Spy Hunter in mind as they were developing Battle Formula. Anyway, this game takes place in the future so you know it's good. Like the original game, you can control your speed by pressing up and down. There are red and blue trucks that will appear cycling letters that you can destroy. These are your power-ups and special weapons. You can get things like an oil slick to leave in your wake, which is very Spy Hunter-like. There's even a bomb that will not only damage everything on screen, but also your eyeballs. You fire with the B button and you have cannons which you can rotate to your side and behind you with button A, unless you have a special weapon ready to use. After you get a few power-ups, these can aim automatically at the closest enemy, which is extremely helpful. It still feels like your firepower is pretty weak though, and it takes a while to get fully powered up. The stages are really nice and varied. In the first stage alone, you're driving on a highway, speeding through the water, and even across the tops of 18-wheelers. The second stage has you going through sand, which can push you in the direction that it's moving. I don't know how a patch of sand can just move in a particular direction on its own, but keep in mind that this game takes place in the future where sand has evolved to be sentient. It's also coarse and irritating, and it just gets everywhere. And it wants to kill you, specifically. The enemies themselves aren't really special, and don't even seem like they're from the future at all. Most of the bosses are definitely from the future though, as I haven't seen anything like this while exploring the world here in the present. I mean, have you? Unlike the original game, you don't die in one hit. You start with a tiny life bar which lets you take four hits. Thankfully, this can be greatly expanded upon. Unfortunately, if you die, your life bar resets to only having four hit points. And this game sure makes a spectacle of how much you suck when you die. Wow. Your weapons are also downgraded after dying, but not all the way. This makes fighting the bosses a tough ordeal when you first get to them and you don't know their patterns yet. Eventually, you'll die so much that you barely have any life and only spit wads being fired from your gun. Believe it or not, they can still be defeated this way if you're really good. This game has unlimited continues and you'll start over from the beginning of the level, so be sure to power yourself back up before you get to the boss. Some stages, like level 3 here, feel insanely long. I think that you might need to take the road splits in the proper order though. For example, on level 2 if you keep staying left, nothing happens at all. Once you go right, then the enemies start appearing again. The graphics are super good for a game like this. It even has some fake rotation effects done with line scrolling in some areas of the road. It's fairly convincing and quite impressive for the NES. This could probably be in a Pushing Hardware Limits episode, so don't get mad at me if this appears again in the future but only if I'm able to get further by then and show some of the other effects. And since this is a proper Sunsoft game, it has incredible sound and music. Sunsoft lost their way in the middle of the 16-bit era when they farmed their games out to Western developers, but when this one came out, they still had what it took. This game is tough and it will require some investment in the form of time and skill to complete. Since the 16-bit platforms were the talk of the town back when this was released, it's not surprising that it didn't get much attention. This game is leagues better than the first Spy Hunter, so be sure to check it out.
And there you go, some more games that just don't get enough appreciation. A lot of you did suggest games, but you know, some of those I'm totally happy with them continuing to be overlooked forever because yeesh. But please keep suggesting games because there are a lot of truly good ones out there. And if you have any suggestions, let me know. In the meantime, thank you for watching GameSag. enjoy playing video games for hours on end? But it doesn't take long before you have no thumb. Ah! Well, why not try the gamer glove? It's lightly cushioned to protect your thumb so you can get further in your favorite games. Yeah, 10 points! Play for hours or even days on end with the Gamer Glove. All right, a new high score! It's the edge that you need. And the cool thing is, is it doesn't just work with Sega. I can get 100 points on Nintendo, too! If you're not using the Gamer Glove, you're not truly playing- Yeah! <clears throat> if you're not using the Gamer Glove, you're not truly playing video games!